Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, latest video discussion as part of the RICS Tech Partner Programme. My name is Andrew Knight and I've been with RICS now for over 11 years. Um, I sit within the standards, regulatory and thought leadership part of the organisation and my role is to look at the uh, effects of data and technology right across the built and natural environment with over 130,000 members worldwide uh, working right across the property life cycle, working on all the different asset types of rural, land, residential, commercial, alternative assets and infrastructure. Uh, data and technology is having a, a huge impact positive uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the way our members work and the way our member firms are, are using technology. And today I'm really, really happy to have uh, Michael join me from uh, Metrica. So please do come and join me, Michael. Great, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's really good to be here. Uh, pleasure, pleasure. Now, but before we get into the kind of the uh, the bits and bites, as it were, and, and what your solution does, it, it'd be great to hear a, a, a bit of background on your history and how you got into the industry, because it's always like uh, nice to to get the human element in it. I think when when we talk to our tech partners. Yeah. So uh, into this industry specifically was when I started to run Metricus and and the previous company that that I brought out. Uh, which you know is in the prop tech space, if you like, but working on all things commercial real estate, uh, whether it's an office building or a warehouse, like you said, we we kind of touch all areas as well. But many years ago, I started off as a sparky or electrician by trade. Yeah. So <laughs> many, many years ago. And then I did electrical engineering and then I left Australia uh, to travel. And then I got into uh, into building data centers and infrastructure and things like that. And then yeah, I've never never been in property before per se in in this kind of space and working with you know uh, asset owners and asset managers and construction companies. But from building the software business and and you know growing it out into this space is how I kind mm. of got into this industry. So yeah, through 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 software and and operational delivery is how I got into this space. Oh, interesting. Uh, and in terms of the origin of, of, of Metricus itse itself, you're one of the founders. Well, what, what was the origin story to use the, the, the common phrase now in terms of Metricus? So Metricus was previously a company that I worked with before called Asset Mapping. So I did a management buyout of the company. Uh, I was brought in by Cisco to help uh, look at the operational side of the business and how to help grow that and grow the, the value of the, uh, the opportunity within the company. Uh, and then three and a half, almost three and a half years ago now, I did a management buyout of the company with my uh, business partner and CEO, Gary Cottle, and a few other investors, uh, and we became Metricus. Uh, and since then, we've we've grown and grown and grown and working with, you know, multiple customers and, you know, building owners and landlords and asset managers globally. So, yeah. So, I mean, in, in general terms, what, what kind of industry changes have you seen since, since you know, you, you got Metricus, uh, as you say, you know, um, bought it out in that way and, and got it going? What, what in the short to medium term, historically, have you seen changing? Uh, I think the biggest thing is something you mentioned in, in your introduction is technology making changes for the better and, and making positive changes. Years ago, You'd have to knock on the door to a, a landlord or a building owner or an FM person, and you'd have to wedge your foot in the door for them to keep talking to you. Mm. But now, you know, the doors open and people are saying, "Come in, please help me. Let me know, you know, what you've got that that can help. You know, we're 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 a solution to a problem. We're not a, a solution looking for a problem. You know, there are things that people need to help deliver better within their buildings, whether that's you know operational maintenance, whether it's ESG." You know whether it's building performance through a BMS, those things are now, you know, as everyone is saying, you know, these days in in one way, shape, or form, COVID has accelerated that, mm -hmm. and we're seeing more and more of that. And and the 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 building landscape for building owners and asset owners is becoming much more competitive than it was before. So they need an advantage. So we are, you know, an, an example. Prior to COVID, we probably ninety percent of our customers were tenant slash occupier and ten percent mm -hmm. landlords. Now we're 50 50. Oh, so there's right. been a big swing change in, in, in that respect for us. I mean, you, you mentioned a few kind of areas there of, of, of how you're ap uh, applying the, you know, the Metrica solution. And you used a great phrase that you know, you're, you're there actually as a solution to a problem, not the other way around. But what sort of challenges are, are you specifically helping with Metricas? It depends on who you are as a customer. So some of our customers, like the Met Office, for example, mm -hmm. we've put we're a software company so we don't make any hardware but we've integrated 40 plus different hardware partners so when a customer comes to us like the met office first started with we need to understand the indoor air quality in more detail in our building because the bms system only has you know 
temperature and humidity mm. and CO2 sensors in you know select areas, not 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 all over the building where we need we think we've got hot and cold spots. So we selected the, uh, the right hardware partner to measure all the parameters that they wanted. And, and they're really an interesting one, which comes back to when we talk about IBOS, they were looking at the well standard to start with. So they need a specific type of sensor, which we put in place. And then we put the rules behind that to give them alerts. Uh, and so we solved the problem for them in that, that instance in their office area. Then we helped them with their supercomputer rooms or their mini data centers. And then we helped them with their uh, radar stations. But it depends on who you are. So some of our customers have asked us to look at you know, prior to COVID, how much space have they got and how much space do they actually need? Mm. Also looking at utilization of desks, also looking at energy monitoring, and then also helping with operational performance. So connecting to the building management system and pulling the data out there. Uh, but so it really does depend. It's a case by case scenario. Leap detection is another big one that we do with, with people as well. If they've got warehousing and they're storing goods uh, and if those goods get water damage, then uh, you know they have to throw them away. So lots of different lots of different areas. It's not mm. we just do one thing for a customer. It depends on the building you have and the solution that you know that you need us to help provide with you. But the amount of sensors we've got integrated and the way technology is developing, there's there's pretty much a piece of hardware that can help connect to our platform and, and give you the data that you need. Indeed, and, and thinking specifically about the whole kind of change in industry behaviour, as you said, it, it's much easier now to, to get engagement with, with potential customers and obviously the whole agenda around sustainability is, as, as part of the kind of whole, whole ESG piece. I, I know a lot of asset managers I talk to are, are still finding it hard to kind of do that ESG reporting. How are you able to support that particular piece of the puzzle at the moment? So right now, we don't have an ESG report in the platform, but it is something that we're building. So, and, and will we have the all singing, all dancing ESG report? No, it's not gonna tick all the boxes for all people. Will it help you report and start to give you an audit trail? Yes, it will. Will you be able to take that data and put it into another system uh, to give you a fuller report? Yes, you will. Uh, and again, it depends on which part, you know, the, the environmental social side, the governance piece is a little bit trickier because kind of how you govern your company, but. The environmental and social piece environmental is you know measuring your water usage your gas usage your energy usage and and then if you overlay indoor air quality and occupancy data you can generally make you know we're yet to see a building that we haven't made savings for energy reductions and if you can put that into a report and then give that to your team that need to report on esg then you're in a good place but it's something that we're working hard on our tech team and our uh, uh, and our we're bringing in an ESG expert. We've got some environmental scientists with our mm. air rated company, but we are bringing in specific people to help that because it's it's going to get bigger and bigger. The reporting requirements are becoming mandatory next year and the year after, you know, depending on where you are globally, you know, SCCR, you know, reporting is becoming more and more important. So we're building a standard set of ESG reports that will help people report and measure and monitor against it but it's it's not going to be you just need our report and it ticks every box it just it, it's better but it'll be a help and 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 provide them with some foundations as you said i mean the esg is so broad in that sense that you need kind of best of breed almost feeding in to give you that that full yeah. picture don't you so you do yeah I mean, Given that, that obviously the, the, the sector is much more mindful now of, of, of a lot of things we've already touched on, how well do you think the various stakeholders understand almost the basics of what they should be measuring in a building when they look, up, look to its performance? Because you know, there's potentially a daunting set of things you could be looking at. It's, some, people, some people have looked into it and some people have said, where do I start? You know, <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's, I, think, I think the framework uh, the, the, I take iBoss as an example. Uh, some people have started looking. You know, there's always there's always the the thought leaders and the proactive people, and then there's the laggards, right? And you need to help all of them in different variations, and some of them need more help than others. A lot of the people we're talking to and our current customers are saying, right, we've got you. How can you help us do more with what we've got? So that's a good thing. And where people haven't started, it's just trying to help them understand where the starting point is and the steps that they can take on that journey because this is this is a journey you can't do this overnight mm -hmm. you know there's a saying i use regularly which is you, you know you can't boil the ocean or you can but it's going to take a very long time it's the same with this journey but also if it's a heavy lifting and there's a lot to do it's a lot harder to get started than if you can take bite-sized chunks 
So, Indeed. Now, so, you, you, you alluded to um, RS, this is new standard, the, you know, the International Building Operations Standard, or IBOS. Uh, having looked at that, what's your perspective about how that's going to help people as a, as a kind of framework to start, as you say, on that kind of journey? Well, it, so what, what I like about it, and, and I didn't know about it until a, a, a while ago, but what I like about it is you've broken it down into pillars. Uh, and and it's, it's not... And, and I say this in the nicest possible way, the, the, like the well standard. The well standard, you have to do your gap analysis and then you have to go all in once you've chosen the route you're going to take. There's a lot of time, effort and energy and money required there. And you generally need to bring other people in to help you get that, that help to help you tick the boxes and make sure you hit your objectives and reach your goals. Then you can, you know, you're going to get a tick in the box and you're going to achieve what you set out to. I think breaking it down into the pillars that you've broken it down into because if you look at the the, the the five pillars you know compliance that can be about temperature indoor air quality lighting and health and safety you know the functional is connectivity flexibility and utilization this could be occupancy levels you know and economic very easy if energy efficiency and life cycle the sustainable is a social environmental and the you know performing that's user satisfaction health and well-being those things you can start to you know you can prioritize as a company where you've, you may have already started your journey or if you haven't started your journey which one of those is the easiest for us to start you know i hate to say ticking the box because it's not a tick box exercise Indeed. but if you can start to achieve some of those sooner rather than later it's a big win for you big win for the business and helps motivate everyone to do the rest of the things that you need to do the other part i like about it is it's it's guidance and support rather than force. You know, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not there to you. Know, if you don't do this, you're in big trouble. Yeah. But if you want, <laughs> if you want guidance and support and some structure and some common sense, this is a very good way to go about it. You know, Indeed. I don't, I don't think anyone's laid it out as, as simply and, and as coherently as, as iBoss is. Indeed, I suppose as we deliberately try to make it as, as simple and intuitive as possible, how do you see yourself being able to sort of almost add value to people when they're using iBoss? Because we've kept it deliberately kind of straightforward and simple, and clearly there'll be some devil in the detail in terms of, of, of actually implementing it and helping people. I think particularly on that kind of maturity uh, journey of, I think you mentioned like the Met Office having to zero in on specific areas. Yes. Whole. How do you see yourself almost building on that as a platform and helping people on that journey? But well, the, the the good thing is, it's almost and and I, as I said, I I didn't know about this until a little while ago, but it, it's almost as if we we're in collaboration when you wrote it because the the five pillars are areas where we help people, whether it's a lot or a little in each area. I, I use the Met Office as the example again. The you know the compliance piece, the temperature, the indoor air quality, and understanding how you know how you hit your compliance levels within a building you look at your indoor air quality as one of those pieces of compliance you know there could also be legionella there could be your emergency light test but one of the easier ones you know and there's do you know about the british standard 40102 coming about coming out very soon it rings a vague bell but there are so many standards on that there, <laughs> there are a lot on the horizon so this is this is the requirement to monitor indoor environmental quality within right. co all commercial buildings so if you look at your compliance piece that's that's one that we're doing with the Met Office around indoor air quality. So that's an easy, you know, thing to say, right, we're already monitoring indoor air quality. That sits along the compliance side. And actually that's where, that's our first starting point, you know? And then if we look at the other part of the, uh, of the Met Office and one of our large banking customers, there's the energy savings. So if you look at the economic part of, of, one of, of your economic pillar, there's already the part where they're they're looking at their buildings, their building operations, and how they save on costs there. So Metricus fits in there because we can connect to the building management system, or we can put energy, you know, CT clamps on and pull the energy data out and give it to them half hourly so they can report on it. A lot of people get it historically; it has to be written down manually. So there's a lot of automation you can bring to manual jobs. But again, it depends on where people start in your five pillars uh, about how we can help. But, you know, we'll be able to help in all areas. Can we solve all problems across all of those five pillars? No. And I'd be lying if I said we could. But where we can, we'll work with our customers and help work the way through them. I, I think people like the Met Office will, will pick up IBOS given given how it was written and how it was built. Indeed. And I guess one of the 
perhaps challenges and opportunities that we identified when we put the standard together was that was that interplay between the pillars and the indicators that, that arguably there are sometimes trade-offs to be made that obviously one could save energy by turning the HVAC off but that's not going to help in terms of air quality and temperature monitoring so there are some kind of <clears throat> balancing acts to be achieved here and I guess what you're delivering is also that ability to see that interplay between the different yeah. pillars and the different indicators because it's not that there's no right answer but it is sometimes trade-offs and adjustments to say well what's yes. the optimum balance because you could save money as I say by just turning everything off but that clearly isn't going to you know, <laughs> give you a high performing building is it? correct and and that and you are right that the the overlay of the data sets is what helps people start to achieve that so uh, we're working. Uh, we're working with a large management consultancy, and we're doing multiple projects globally. But the really interesting part, if if, if you know, if we look at the if we look at the pillars, uh, I would say I'm just going back to them now. I've got them in front of me. Mm -hmm. You know, if if we look at the sustainable piece and the economic piece, what we did, and we haven't connected to the building management system yet, Andrew. But we put ca capacity and footfall sensors in, indoor air quality sensors, and we put some occupancy sensors in meeting rooms. And looking at the data with them, we can see that it's a landlord controlled building, so they can't control the BMS themselves, but they can make requests. So in winter, still in Spain, they still do need the heating on in certain areas. That the heating was coming on at 7.30, but no one was coming in to 8.30, 9 o'clock. And then they're all gone by 6.30, but the heating was yeah. staying on until 7.30, 8 o'clock. So we just said, look, you, know, you may want to ask the landlord to turn it on an hour later and turn it off an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. And what they've done, they, their own data and uh, analysts have worked out that by doing so, they'll save 50,000 euros a year on energy just over these mm. three floors. So two different data sets without even connecting to the BMS, yeah. without just turning everything off and making it either really hot or really cold, you can start to get some real value from that. Yeah. No, it's extraordinary that those, those quite big marginal gains from what would seem a relatively small adjustment to some extent. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. And but, and people people think and, and this is you know the, the age old added of smart buildings companies generally trying to sell you the all singing all dancing smart building, you don't need to do that to see real benefits. You know there's there's you know Met Office is is an example of that. They've grown and grown and grown with us through changes. The the management consultancy firm are now we're doing multiple projects globally with them. When you start to pull the data out, generally BMS data is locked away either in the basement or in a room where only BMS engineers look at it when they need to or they get an alert. And generally there are so many alerts, they only really look at the really bad alerts, which is when there's a real problem. But you can make you can make quite substantial changes and savings if you connect different data sets and you can overlay one on top of the other. And that doesn't mean, you know, connecting the building up so when you walk up it knows Michael's there and it opens the gate turnstile and sends the lift to whatever floor you think you need to go to and then it brushes your teeth for you and all that sort of stuff yeah. it's, it's uh yeah it's the sim simple things and, and the easy things can make quite large changes in buildings and and to the economic and sustainable part of, of a building and then help the performance side of it you know if you're if you're not running your HVAC and those normal hours anymore, then you're reducing the load on that HVAC, which means you can extend the life of it, and you can start, to, you know, you yeah. can start to reduce the 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 wear and tear on on the, the building management system or the HVAC system. Indeed, no, and, and one thing that we're, we're, once again we were very mindful of when when we wrote the standard was that you know the majority of the building stock is is not the edge. It's not a hugely you know smart building landscape. To, to be blunt, is it? We're, we're talking about a lot of retrofitting to existing assets where sensors will begin to be deployed. But you've got to start with what you find and what you work with. So you can't just you know leap straight to these incredibly smart buildings when a lot of assets are already out there and, and need to be kind of retrofitted and take almost baby steps, I suppose, in that respect. Well, at nine. 95 plus percent of our customers are retrofit buildings mm. so we do have new buildings you know we work with landlords in the UK and, and in you know, North America uh, well globally on, on brand new builds we've got some that are being finished in July we've got some being finished in Q4 we've got some being finished early next year but 95 percent of our buildings are retrofit so, so going into existing stock whether it's five years old 10 years old or 20 years old we're doing retrofit in, into buildings and the cost isn't as high as everyone thinks. You know, the, one of the things that is coming up now, if you need to deploy tens of thousands of sensors, is looking at the sustainability of those sensors. Do you do you use powered sensors or battery sensors? Because if you've got tens of thousands of sensors, you'll need tens of thousands of batteries at a certain point to be swapped out. And what's the environmental impact of that, as opposed to putting in low voltage powered sensors that can stay there for 10, 20 years, you know, if, if they've got that total lifespan.
Yeah, indeed, indeed. Now, um, you, you alluded to earlier that the kind of almost the mix of your client base was changing in terms of that kind of percentage split. And, and one of the things we, we put in the IBOS standard was a bit of an overview of all the different stakeholders that are involved in this kind of context of building performance. What, what kind of different insights are, are, you, are you seeing that are helping these different profiles, whether it's the asset owner, whether it's surveyors, whether it's the occupiers, because obviously everybody's probably getting subtly different things from this in, in terms of the insight and the information they're getting. Yeah, the, 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 it, it's very different if you're the tenant slash occupier as opposed to the landlord. If you're owner occupier, slightly different. If you're the tenant, you generally want to know, and again, it depends on what, what people are coming to us for, but indoor air quality is just going through the roof. So mm. because of COVID, everyone's an indoor air quality expert and you know, what, <laughs> everyone knows what dust is now, PM 2.5, PM 10, you know, and CO2, whereas before they just, you know, not blindly, but, you know, all unaware that they're walking into a building with what, what felt like good air, but you weren't sure about or what didn't, you know, felt a bit stuffy. That I think is a big thing. And if somebody is... Uh, you know, when you're, if you're a surveyor, as an example, uh, mm. for just for a minute, when you're going into a building, if you can take a sensor in and you can look at the air, the air quality in a building, if you're surveying that building, you can give, you know, data back to the person you're surveying the building for, uh, which historically you couldn't do. And if you're surveying lots of buildings and you can leave sensors in, you can leave them in there for a few weeks and then give them the data back. And you as a surveyor can pull that data in and say, right, you know, with Metricus, you can look at the indoor air quality and the outdoor air quality, and you can bring the two together, and the surveyor can get much richer insights than they previously mm. did. Landlords, again, indoor air quality, occupancy and capacity, and energy monitoring, depending on which one you're starting with, you've got that data 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you need it. Most buildings are nine to five, Monday to Friday, but you can really start to look at shutting your HVAC down and turning your lights off if you really want to. There's still mm. the I still see lights on everywhere all over London, right? So, you know, it's it's turning those off. And then from a landlord side, landlord giving them the data to understand the, how they're providing a service to their tenants, what the common areas are like for indoor air quality, what's their energy usage, can they get the energy data, you know, per tenant, which they probably never were able to do before. Now you can get that half hourly, you can provide, you know, more accurate billing to your tenants. There's there's multiple ways, and I still think there's ways that we've not thought of yet and things mm. that can be done, but more technology comes out, the, the more things you can support and help with. Now, you, you mentioned earlier, what, what, somewhat sort of, dare I say, uh, the, the cliche now that COVID has accelerated so many trends, but what, if you get your crystal ball out, where, where do you see the, the, the industry going? What, what do you think? Is it more of the same in terms of the trends, or is there something, do you think things are going to come out of left field that we haven't, haven't really sort of addressed yet? Uh, I think it depends on on the on the the customer as well and who we're talking about. But I think people are looking. Uh, life is easier if you've got a set of standards to work to. Number one, because if you if you don't have something that you're working to, how do you know you've achieved what you you started to, you know you set out to achieve? So I think something like IBOS, where people can write it down as a group and a team, and say this is our start point, this is our finish point this is what we're going to work towards. Now, whether you start at the energy piece, the indoor air quality piece, the maintenance and operational piece, or the occupancy piece and the capacity piece, if you're the, you're the tenant slash occupier, I think, I think more, of that, more of that will help people achieve their goals a, a, across the board. I think there's more standards coming out. There's the, there's the one that one of my team just sent me about the requirement to, you know, that, that safety, the, the, is it the Safety Risk Act that, that's just come out in the UK oh, as well the, yeah, around buildings? Building in the UK, yeah. Yeah, and then you've got BS 40102. You've got, you know, local law outside of the UK. You've got local law 97 in New York. More of these things are going mm. to spring up. So I think what is going to happen, there's more and more legislation that's going to come out and you will need to prove that you are adapting to that legislation. You'll need an audit trail and a platform mm. or some type of tool to report against it. So I think I think that's only going to happen more and more and more. There's a lot of net zero targets that need to be met. You know, greenwashing is a big thing. Everyone's talking about it. But when you dig, you know, was it was it DWS uh, that was just raided in Europe last week or the week before for mm. you know, saying that they've done something, but actually they hadn't. And there was a lot of greenwashing. I think legislation is going to play a big, big part in what people start to do in buildings. I think 
all the fluffy stuff about walking up to a building and it opening and closing and the windows and the lights going on off and all that sort of stuff. I do actually think that will fade out because mm. it's a fad. It's like all the gadgets. I bought a new car for the first time in a long time, a couple of years ago. Mm. It's got lots of gadgets in it. I put it in drive and I go from A to B and I turn the heating yeah. or cooling up and down as I need to. Do I use <laughs> yes. every gadget in there? No, I don't. Do I use what I need? Yes, I do. So, <laughs> I think we'll see some things fade away over time. Yeah. I think legislation will will become uh, more and more of a driver to help people understand their buildings more, whether you're occupier or landlord. And I think the I, I think from a a landlord side to stay competitive, you'll need to figure out what that competitive edge is, whether that's you know indoor air quality. You know, saying you've got a smart building is one thing, but proving you've got a smart building yeah. is another. So being able to some people now, you know, Salesforce announced. I think it was two months ago now that their all of their execs part of the big part of their bonus will be based on the ESG results of the company. That's going to trickle down to lots of other yeah. people. So that, that will drive what people do in buildings. You know, do I know some new cool tech that's coming out? There's cool tech coming out every day, but what's the use of that tech if it's not yeah. going to help you meet your company objectives? So I, I do think legislation is going to be a big driver. And if you've got legislation, you need a you need a, a a path to get there, and you need some standards to get there, or some guidance to get there. Otherwise, you're just you know you're shooting in the, you know shooting in the breeze to try and figure out whether you know whether you're going to hit your target or not. So I, I guess in in summary, sort of almost somewhat putting words in your mouth, it's almost a combination now of that kind of compliance and legislative drive, but also that demand from 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 occupiers and and their employees for for better buildings that actually people yes. want to they want to have yeah. a nicer environment, particularly in a, in a work setting. And at the same time, there'll be that compliance angle saying, well, actually, and you've got to deliver this minimum level, which will get higher and higher. Plus, there's that kind of people voting with their feet in terms of not wanting to go into the office if they don't feel it's a it's a nice productive space to be in exactly right yeah pretty much so what, what 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 does the future hold for for, for metricus in terms of the developments you, i know you mentioned some of that work on sort of esg type dashboards but what are the things uh, uh will you be focusing on that in the coming months and uh, short to medium term uh, so we've got we're, we're currently on version three of our platform next gen is the is the new one that's coming out uh, and in that will be the ESG reporting the local law 97 but also we've what we're seeing a lot of now as well is people <clears throat> wanting to use a platform to either plug into or pull data out of to do their own reporting so we we had an we had an, an open API before but we've now rebuilt that API so it's a lot more adaptable for people so if you want to take the data out of Metricus, which one of our Canadian landlords does and stick it into Power BI or something like yeah. that. You can do that all day long. If you want to build a whole new platform to visualize data and give that to a customer of yours, you can do that using Metricus. Mm -hmm. And also the other part for us is when there's a new sensor out and a customer would like us to integrate it, we have to do all the heavy lifting at the moment. So mm -hmm. it costs the customer. So yeah. with our new API and, and if you deliver the data to us in a set standard, you can plug that sensor straight in and the customer can start collecting data straight away. So ease of use, uh, you know, uh, ease of adaptability is one of the things we're looking at because not everyone is going to want to say, I want the full fat version of Metricus, which is the front end, the rules engine and everything. Yeah. We've already got Power BI as an example where we do all of our management reporting, but we need all the data that comes from occupancy, capacity, indoor air quality, energy, water, sensors. But we're not going to build that platform, but we just need the data via an API to get it out. So so flexibility is, is key for us. And, and I think that's more and more of that will happen from us. The people who do use the full fat version of Metricus, reporting is 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 one of the things that we're really driving towards as well, because... If, you know, again, as I said before, we're not the silver bullet, but we can help them with the reporting. If we can help them with an audit trail, then that's important because legislation, I think, is going to drive more and more. So that's that's where we're going with our development and our platform. That's great. And I suppose, you know, it, it certainly echoes one of my concerns is, is is that interoperability, that ability for data to flow around more easily, for, yeah. for effectively hardware and software to be, to use the phrase plug and you know, plug, plug and play in that way that, that we yeah. we need an industry that's able to, to bolt best of breed devices together and best of breed platforms because we don't end up in kind of walled gardens in that way, do we, Michael? So, well, it's been great to talk and, and very illuminating and, and some really interesting uh, stories, uh, narrative there about how you're working with clients on this. But for today, 
thanks ever so much for your time and I look forward to catching up again soon. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much for having me on, Andrew. It's been really good.